I think on one hand, uh, I always sort of had it, the good, the good angel on my shoulder that was saying, Hey, look, you know, you've got an opportunity that lots of other kids don't, you've got a good school, you've got the supportive family to go and do what you want. You know, you need to start, you know, you need to go and study and, but what for, I had no idea. Yeah, so I grew up in Melbourne, um, in a, what at the time was a pretty working class, like Northern Melbourne suburb called Preston. Um, uh, yeah, my parents had been, uh, my parents were, mum's a teacher, uh, dad was a, a company manager, I suppose, you know, sort of business person, um, had dabbled in academia. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had a, uh, well, I still have, um, I have a, a full sister. I have some half siblings that came along much later down the track. Um, but yeah, I, it was, um, it's pretty interesting. So my parents separated when I was pretty young. Uh, and so I had a, a sort of traditional family you know, the traditional family, unit of two, and then that expanded to my parents both remarried like relatively quickly. Um, and so I know like a lot of kids have, you know, sort of feel that as a bit of a traumatic episode, but I just saw it as, you know, I was young enough to think, oh, actually I had two parents. Now I've got four parents and they're all very different people. So they're all very different inspirations and, um, and effects on me all very positive, uh, but they're all like, you couldn't get four more uh, different people, um, than the four of them. Um, and yeah, I think I was, I was very lucky that both of my parents had come from, um, you know, both of them had come from pretty modest, uh, backgrounds. Um, and both were the first in their families to go to university, I think, get good educations. And so I think had a very, um, yeah, a, ve a very sort of positive and aspirational outlook for, uh, myself and my sister. Um, and so we're lucky enough to go to good schools, get good educations. Um, but I think most importantly, they didn't have a sort of a predefined end destination for us either, uh, as they were pretty open-minded, maybe products of growing up and, you know, being, going through the seventies themselves is that they were pretty open-minded about um, what my sister and I wanted to do and wanted to experience and explore in life. And, I, you know, I don't think we ever felt too much pressure um, to go and go down a particular path in life. Um, yeah, we were always given the sort of permission to go and explore what our interests were and, you know, where we wanted to end up. And, yeah, ultimately that's um, ended up with, me and, and my sister and other uh, half siblings as well, um, doing a whole sort of like range of weird and wonderful things, um, through our lives. But yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how it all started. Huh. So it was like a happy childhood. Yeah, it was like, a, it's funny people, you, people say, oh, you know, parents separated and divorced and like, I don't really think of it like that. I, maybe I have a very optimistic outlook on life and, um, I see it more as, well, I gained a couple of extra parents. I had, you know, fantastic influences growing up. Um, like my stepmother was a, you know, sort of was a repeat entrepreneur and founder. Um, dad had a fairly sort of traditional business background, but also stint in academia. Mum was a teacher um, and stepfather was in agriculture as well. So it was a pretty sort of like diverse upbringing, I would say. Yeah. So yeah, very happy. Uh, yeah. Very happy childhood. I had really good friends. Um, yeah, really good influences around me as well. Um, and I think, yeah, I was just this sort of curious kid and I had a, lots of opportunities and avenues to explore and follow that curiosity. Cool. And what were your both sets of grandparents grew up in that part of Melbourne as well? <laughs> No, no, no. So, well, my, my paternal grandparents did. So, um, they grew up just around the corner from where, uh, sorry, maternal grandparents. Um, they grew up just around the corner from where we lived. So they were 
pretty constant influences in our lives as well. Um, you know, couldn't meet more two salt of the earth people than my mum's parents. Um, I think they had this extraordinary, you know, they've been, they're still alive. So they're in their mid nineties now, um, and have been married for more than 70 years. Um, and yeah, which is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, and you couldn't, uh, meet two more sort of selfless people. Um, I think they instilled in us the that, you know, sort of a part of the essence of life is what you do for others, um, uh, not what you take from everyone else. Um, you know, they spent a lot of their public holidays and holidays, um, you know, helping out with charities, um, helping, yeah, helping other people. They didn't come from a lot and, um, you know, they, and they still showed that, you know, it was actually about what you did for other people. Um, that was what was important. And, uh, my paternal grandparents died before, both of them died before I was born. So, um, dad's parents both died, uh, both from various cancers, uh, in their, in their mid forties. Um, and so dad was pretty young when that happened. He had a younger brother as well, who was also very young when they died. Um, and yeah, I think he, grew up in, dad grew up in Footscray, so which is another very, at the time, very much a working class, uh, blue collar suburb in the west of Melbourne. And um, I think sort of goes back to, you know, I think education was a big feature of, and it has been a big feature of our family's lives um, and the importance of, of that. And that, yeah, he was very lucky in that a, uh, teacher at his primary school, at his local primary school, realised he could probably do something with his life, and recommended him for a scholarship to go to um, to to a good school, um, which he, which he got, and that sort of changed the probably changed the course of all of our lives in many ways. Um, so yeah, uh, my paternal grandparents not not in the picture, but I think um, you know a pretty uh, you know s sort of a spectre of you know their lives cut short. Uh, I think loom large, I think, over my dad and um, has definitely provided a lot of inspiration for some of the um, things that I've done in later life as well that, you know, makes you realize life is pretty short. Um, I'm not far off, I'm not that far off the age they were when they passed away as well. So yeah, it makes you very realize and instill like how much you have to sort of grab things and, and sort of run with them while you've got the chance. So would he talk about it, his parents much? A, a little bit. Um, I think in t more in the abstract, I think, as far as them as a source of inspiration. Um, and that I, I think, you know, they were, although they were very much, um, you know, they had working class careers, um, you know, they worked in factories. They were obviously quite clever people. Um, and... I, I think would have loved to have gotten and had the opportunity to have a, a, a good education and a different, a different career path as well and a different life path, I think. Um, yeah. So I think in, in that, uh, in that, um, sort of context as well, he would talk about them, but, uh, I think that, you know, it's like lots of things, memories fade over time. I think there are sort of pockets of memories that he had that he's relayed to us over the years um, uh, but yeah, I think mostly as a, uh, almost as a, in, in its symbolic form <laughs> more than the reality of, of them as people. And do you know much about your ancestors? Yeah, we've got the most, um, uh, plain, uh, white person, Anglo-Saxon heritage going around, I think, you know, Scottish and Irish, uh, Scottish, Irish and English on all sides, really, you know, I think they probably followed each other on sequential boats over here. Um, and, uh, I think the joke was that the Scot, ironically, the Scots were the criminals and the Irish were the policemen of our family. So, uh, on my mum's side, they were mostly Irish. Um, they came over as mounted, mounted policemen, um, and they were brought over to help in the hunt for Ned Kelly, or so the family legend goes. <laughs> that's, 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 I'm sure there's probably been some embellishment over the years of that, but I, I have seen some photos of um, and sketches of um, great-great-grandparents or great-great-grandfather 
um, out on the hunt and with the guy who uh, I think his name's Captain Standish, who was famous for sort of bringing in Ned Kelly as well. So, yeah, the uh, the Irish side of the family were were the policemen, not the convicts, um, as is often seen as the other way around. Okay. But not, but was... yeah. Go on. Yeah, so, um, and in the Scottish side of the family, um, MacLeod, as I later found out, um, was all of the MacLeods originated from the Isle of Skye and um, uh, off the coast, of, off the coast of, what's that, Western Scotland. And um, I, I knew very little about it. And um, when my kids were born, I started doing a little bit of research into the sort of the MacLeod family heritage, because there's quite a lot of them. And um, yeah, it turns out um, the MacLeods weren't the nicest of people. There's probably a, like a, a reason why we were run out of Scotland or uh, ended up in other parts of the world. And I was reading some of the some of the history, and I think um, some of it formed the inspiration for a few episodes of Game of Thrones uh, as well. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, yep, that's pretty interesting. Uh, pretty interesting. Pretty nasty stuff. But um, I suppose different, different, different times. Um, yeah, but uh, it's, it's actually an area of the family history. I've, I, I've been very keen to sort of reconnect with as my kids grow up, um, to get back to the Isle of Skye, check out what's going on, see the castle, um, you know, see the Talisker distillery, which was James Bond's drink of choice. Um, but yeah, I haven't gotten there yet. Oh my God. I was there right before I saw you in oh, really? January or February. Yeah. How was it? Is it, is it worth a visit? Yeah. It's amazing. So beautiful. I've seen that. I've, I've seen lots of photos, but I couldn't tell whether they were like Instagram special or like it does actually look that beautiful. Cause um, yeah, it does look, it does look pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So Okay, so the main values from your parents and step parents, I guess, were curiosity. Yeah, I think I think curiosity, and then sort of curiosity backed up with hard work, um, and I think that was a that was a really interesting tension that I didn't sort of like really appreciate until later in life. Is that if I can work extraordinarily hard like as in obsessive focus on things if i find it interesting if i don't find it interesting i will just tune out if someone says oh hey you've got to go and do this because you know no, no great reason or it's no inherent interest um you know probably find the first opportunity to cast it to the side like i submitted my taxes today um and it, like that's been on the like to do list for nearly twelve months, and I've been like avoiding it like the plague. And um, but yeah, I think definitely curiosity has been this like consistent theme. Is in if if I find something that's interesting, like I have to know everything about it. Um, and you know, go and you know if you have if uh, my normal office background's not behind me, but it's just full of books. Um lots of which remain unread um, because the sort of the, the curiosity ended with some of those things. But um, yeah, definitely curiosity, hard work. I don't think anyone ever had to tell us to work hard as kids. Um, and when we were growing up is that it was just, just part of it. You know, I had, I think, you know, you can, it was back in the day, you could get your first job when you were 14 and nine months. Uh, I think 14, nine months and one day I had, had my first job. Um, and uh, which is, yeah, what was it? So it's actually, believe it or not, I was 14 or nine months and working in a nightclub, um, picking up, <laughs> picking up glasses, doing dishes. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. So the, the place where I worked was, uh, it's knock it's getting, it's been knocked down now, but it was the old Metro nightclub on Burke street. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you couldn't have 50, nearly 15 year olds working in nightclubs today, um, on their, on their weekends. Um, but yeah, it was pretty amazing. Like for a 15 year old got to go and see like some amazing, amazing bands and artists for free, or well, I was getting paid for it as well. So, um, 
got to meet all kinds of amazing people in the music industry, like Fatboy Slim, um, Cypress Hill played when I was there. Uh, so there are all of these like amazing artists got to see as part of this first job. Um, and then, yeah, had a, a, always like enjoyed earning my own money as well. Like I had, um, I, I think that was the other thing as well that we had a lot of was independence. And I think that was drilled into us pretty hard. It was around like independent thought, um, and not, um, not just subscribing to something because someone else says that that's the thing to do. Um, it's probably gotten me and the rest of my family in, in a bunch of trouble over the years, um, from not doing that. But, um, yeah, I think working was a big part of being able to be independent. Like, Oh, I've got, you know, I think of getting paid like seven bucks an hour or something like that. Like you can't even buy a sandwich for seven bucks anymore. Uh, but it was, yeah, this sort of exhilarating, like I turn up, you know, I clock in, they're actually still clocking cards, you know, you clock in, do your thing, and then magically money appears in your bank account, uh, you know, at the end of the week. And that was a, yeah, that was a pretty cool, like, realization for me. How did you get the job? Um, nepotism. Um, yeah, my, <laughs> my auntie, uh, had been had been involved with the metro nightclub and the and the guys who started it i think she'd been to school with them um there are a couple of couple of brothers who had been big in the nightclub industry in melbourne in the 80s and 90s and um yeah some of the biggest nightclubs uh in melbourne were built by them i think they ended up going to build casinos or something um but yeah, she'd known them from school days. And so, yeah, it was just straight, straight nepotism. Uh, I had, uh, I wish I had a better story, but it was, um, I said, I need a job. No, that's a good story. I mean, that's how the world works for most. It's like, you need a job. You ask some people, you know, and then they're like, here, wash these dishes. So. Yeah. It was, um, and I've, I think I've just parlayed that into different like, career paths over time as well. Like, you know, the story, some of the stories from doing that work, I think got me my next job. And then, you know, every subsequent job has almost been like, I think I, I was thinking about this the other day. Like, I don't think I have ever truly applied for a job. Um, and I've had a sort of a weird, weird and wonderful array of like things that I've done over the years, but yeah, I don't think I've ever applied for one <laughs> or maybe I've applied and been rejected, but yeah, I've never actually gotten a job that I have done through a, a formal application path. Wow. Yeah. I think I'm similar. Like I've definitely applied and been rejected so many times, but <laughs> yeah. and then, so I'm like, what's the point when it always just ends up whether it's like selling footy records or whatever to like a proper job job. It's always been through a connection in the end yeah. through all the rejections. Yeah. And I think like, ultimately, like I was thinking about this, I'm like, oh, if I, if I just sort of ridden this, um, nepotistic way, wave or something along those lines, my whole life. And, um, and then I realized like it is, you know, jobs are, you know, fundamentally, you know, this sort of arena of human connection really. And people want to work with other people that they like and enjoy. And it's, it's really hard to discern in a, like a normal recruitment process. Um, you know, here's your CV, you know, how do you do X, Y, and Z? Tell me about a time when like, it feels, it's always felt very staid and, um, very, you know, sort of inorganic, I suppose, or unnatural, um, as to how that's, how that's happened. And I think it's hard to actually extract, you know, what, what someone's looking for, um, when they're hiring you, it's, you know, fundamentally, like, can you do the job? I, you know, can I trust you? Do I want to work with you? Um, and it's really hard to come through in sort of like a normal job process. So I think I've managed to somehow like convince people over the years that, you know, I can heard all those couple of criteria, but yeah, definitely not, through, not through a, not through a normal, um, application process. Yeah. But yeah, when you think about whether it's like a scrappy startup or needing people, some people to wash the dishes, it's like you you don't necessarily have the time or resources to like run a whole process of like, we're going to like 
do this thing to find someone who can watch. It's like, no, who's the nearest person who can like wash the dishes? Same with like, we need a marketing director like ASAP, like who, and then you ask people and there's already trust because people can refer someone and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. It's just kind of gross. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. And like later on, you know, in my, as I started sort of building and running and scaling companies, like that they've always been in working with other companies that have been scaling. Like that's always been the hardest part is once you get outside of two rings of, you know, sort of familiar connections and you're bringing in, you know, sort of in air quotes, outsiders, um, into the, uh, into the equation, like that's where a lot of companies fall down. Like that is, and is a real, um, handbrake for lots of companies because you make a lot more mistakes. Um, so that, and, you know, there is some school of thought which says, well, if you're not, if you're not reaching far enough, you're probably not getting the best candidates early on. But I think that mostly it is, you know, early on in a company's life cycle, you want to know, you know, can someone do the job? Um, if you've worked with them before, you know that, um, you know, are they going to work hard? If you've worked, you know, if they, if you've worked with them before, you know, their work ethic pretty quickly. Um, and you know, they, do they have the sort of raw, the intellectual horsepower, um, to be able to sort of solve problems well, work with other people, like, even if they don't know really what they're doing, are they pretty adaptable? And I think those things are, yeah, you only know those things from spending time with people really. Um, it's, and then, yeah, once you start to get to those outer rings of, you know, sort of connections as well, you know, further past Dunbar's number, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a wild world out there and it doesn't sound very egalitarian, but, uh, I just think, you know, that becomes, um, yeah, it becomes a lot, lot, lot trickier to hire really good people and to have that consistent hit rate. Yeah. And then I guess I'm thinking if it's like, okay, concerns about like certain groups of people, like falling behind in society or something or not having the same opportunities, then it would be like empowering people to, of like how they can start businesses or they can achieve whatever they. Yep. What? Yeah. Or yeah. I mean, I guess which with women, that's like an obvious one that it's like, okay, the, some of the like, I don't know, confidence or bravado or something in it, then it can be like taught and I don't know, it's hard, but it's because you see it in any job, even it doesn't have to be a comp. It doesn't, it could be like a, you know, within a franchise or within like, you know, taxi drivers or like within a, the back, you know, the kitchen and they're all like, because naturally it's like, okay, let's just, we're all from Tibet. Like let's hire our friends who are, this is like my brother working mm. a fruit shop and then like everyone's Tibetan and, and it's not, it's just like a kind of natural progression. So it's. Yeah. And, and I think that's right. Like there are some of these, um, yeah, it's funny, right? Like I spent most of my career, like, working in and building startup companies and startup companies in, um, in principle, uh, like very egalitarian institutions. Um, and you know, it is that in many ways they're sort of designed to be a very purist sort of meritocracy, uh, because it's usually initially a bunch of people coming together that saying, Hey, like the existing way of doing this is broken. Let's go and do it a better way. So there's sort of like these very, in grand, like aligned pirates, uh, you know, that are sort of, you know, trying to disrupt the status quo, but yeah, it, that can become quite clicky. Like, and a lot of the complaints of, and I think quite legitimate ones of, you know, sort of larger startup culture is, you know, these become sort of cult-like in many ways. And, you know, um, that's often not a good thing is that they have these, you know, set of sort of exclusionary, uh, values as well. And, or just by virtue of the environment that those people create, um, it can be off putting to a lot of people. And usually companies are molded in the image of the first five, 10, 15 people at that company. Um, so it's not just a matter of, Hey, 
you know, can we go and find, you know, can we go and find a person like, or, you know, can a person come and apply for a job? It's, it is very, you know, it, it's almost like, it can be like organ rejection almost. So yeah, people, I, I, yeah, I think the models of, you know, equity for how people access those types of opportunities still got a lot of work to do. I think that was one shocking thing for me is I, you know, I sort of gravitated towards building companies because I thought it was a more meritocratic um, way of people whose efforts being recognized um, and being able to build value off the back of your efforts. Um, and that's true. That is true to an extent. Um, but I think that without sort of some additional help and nurturing, like that can break down pretty quickly. Um, and companies can become, um, yeah, these sort of like self-reflective type uh, edifices as well that isn't necessarily, you know, helping lots of people um, get ahead, um, which, yeah, I think is, you know, for my mind is what I think, you know, starting businesses and building businesses can be about, like anyone can do it. Um, but yeah, it's not as, uh, the, the sort of the landscape is still not as inclusive and is a bigger leveler, um, is what it should be. Hmm. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. Um, finance as well, like hedge funds One, it's like, we are just here to make money. So we just want smart people. And then naturally it's like the most diverse environment, like racially, religion, whatever. It's like, we don't care what any of your stuff is. It's like, can you help make money? But then, but then I guess you're, yeah, you will have a cultural thing. That's like, this is a certain type of personality in, but then it's kind of like, okay, go, like if that culture doesn't work for you, you can go somewhere yeah. else. I guess. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating though. Like, it's a really interesting point in that you know, uh, you know, hedge funds are businesses that are off criticised for yeah, they only have a pure you know singular objective, and you know there is debate as to whether you know that objective, it, it, you know, is a sort of a net benefit to society or zero sum or net negative. Um, but you're right, like they are very meritocratic institutions because the objective is so clear. Uh, as to what they're trying to do. And it, it is so, it is purely, you know, by definition quantifiable that if someone can do that job well, like they're going to be, you know, they're going to be in the running. Um, you know, they're going to be looked upon favorably. It doesn't matter, you know, who's, you know, whose mate they are or, you know, who they went to university with or who they grew up with so much. Like it, there is a very easy way to distinguish high performance from low performance in that kind of environment. Um, and I think that's where the, it gets, you know, sort of merit becomes derailed is, you know, how you sort of qu quantify the value that people bring, um, you know, to their work in more, um, you know, where, where the objectives or the outcomes are more ambiguous is harder. And that's how a lot of these sort of, yeah, some of these systemic problems propagate is because the measures are subjective. I don't have an answer to how you make them more objective, but um, yeah, I think that's where, where it sort of runs, you know, runs a sort of a pretty yeah, tough time um, to try and get like, yeah, to get to the canonical truth of like, what is, what is someone doing in this business? Like what value are they adding? Um, all of those kinds of things, you know, everyone's worked in a workplace where you like, why is that person still here? Like, but somehow instead of getting, you know, getting shown the door, they keep getting promoted and you're like, on, on what basis? Um, and yeah, I think that type of, that type of thing is, um, frustrating for a lot of people. Like I think if I was in a different position, if I thought, you know, I was very good at my job, but you know, for whatever other reason, like I didn't have a particular you know, historical connection to someone or, you know, it didn't, didn't, you know, gel particularly with other people, you know, higher up in the organization. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's a, it's a really sort of hard, but also valuable problem to solve, uh, as to how do you get the best out of people? How do you recognize 
how do you recognize talent properly? How do you recognize contribution properly? Um, yeah, I think it leads to a lot of inequity and inefficiency and in not only the economy, but also society as well. Mm. Okay. I have so many thoughts, but we need to go back to your story. So what, what were you thinking about at school about what you would do with your life and how did you choose? Oh, that's a very good question. I think like I was conflicted because on one hand I had no idea, like I, I wanted to do everything. Like I think at one point, um, I wanted, uh, like I wanted to be a spy, I think at one point as well, cause that sounded pretty cool. Um, uh, I was, yeah, was going to, was going to go to the defense forces for a bit. Um, looked at different types of being different types of scientists, engineer, um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, in hindsight, because I have this, uh, like insatiably sort of like curious mind, I think that I would sort of jump from thing to thing. Um, and then when it came time to, you know, sort of start making a decision of like, oh, you know, what, what do you want to do at university? Uh, I had no idea. And I felt like probably a bit lost by it. Cause I'm like, well, this whole system has been sort of geared towards, you know, sending, sent, you know, setting us up to go to university and, you know, and whatever beyond. Um, but like really felt like a square peg in a round hole and, you know, the, the sort of internal conflict where you're thinking about, ah, oh, geez, I, you know, I, I feel like I need to do a good job at this, at this thing, you know, put it, put work into my studies, but I don't know what for, um, w was really hard. I knew I wanted to go out and build things and, and, but, you know, probably have two softer hands to be an actual builder. Um, but yeah, I don't think really had conceptualized like what that was as a job or a career. Um, it was like, I'm interested in a bunch of stuff. I'm sort of fairly action orientated, a bit of an all rounder. What does that translate to as a career path? Sounds like a um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't sound like much. So yeah, I think that was a really tricky, um, type of, uh, type of balancing act. And I see like lots of kids going through it now. Um, and I think the, like the paths and the ways that they sort of like group and think about kids are far less cookie cutter than they were back 20 something years ago. Um, yeah. So at school, did it make sense to you of like, oh, okay, I want to get better grades to pr open more opportunities or something? Or was it more like you just did what you were interested in and you would do well if you were more interested and otherwise you didn't care? Yeah, the latter. Um, so I, I think on one hand, uh, I always sort of had this, um, had this like little um, you know, sort of the, the, the good angel on my shoulder that was saying, Hey, look, you know, you've got an opportunity that lots of other kids don't, you've got a good school, you've got the supportive family to go and do what you want. You know, you need to study, you know, you need to go and study. And, but what for, I had no idea. Uh, so yeah, I think it was, I think it was more of the latter in that, you know, there were certain things that I was interested in and, I would just go boom, like straight down a rabbit hole with them. Um, yeah. And it, it's funny, like some of the things that I disliked intensely at school, um, I found, I later found sort of a, a different lens into like mathematics, for instance, I didn't like it at school. Um, and then when I got to university and beyond, I really enjoyed it. Like I found a different portal into the world of maths and really gravitated towards it and absolutely loved the sort of the problem solving of it, the sort of abstract sort of way to sort of quantify the world and the universe. Um, but yeah, hated it at school. Um, and I think that was like me for a lot of things. I had to find the application of it. I had to find like how, it, on what plane this sort of connects with me. Um, otherwise just psst, game over. Huh? So what's an example of you getting super interested in stuff and then like, would it be like, I want to learn how jet engines work and then you like find books or like watch videos about it. And then to the point that you get bored and then you're like, okay, 
Yeah. Okay. The, the, the big one for me was programming. So um, programming just like connected with me like a drug um, almost. And um, as soon as I did it, I was like, I need to know everything about this. I need to know like how a computer works at a very fundamental level, like that level of obsession. And uh, yeah, it was it was uh I, I could make it all consuming and uh, i still do to some extent like i still use it even though a lot of my day to day is um like you know talking with people meetings those types of things like i still use it as a bit of uh you know stress release almost as like a escape to another world so yeah programming for me was a you know from you know year 10 11 uh, was this, yeah, hugely interesting, multifaceted type of, um, subject that, uh, yeah, just absolutely loved and, and still do to this day. Cool. And this is just like what you'd want to do in your free time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, like years later when that's a like really good question. Um, cause we, when I was hiring for, technical people and still to this day, you know, give this advice to other early stage company founders. It's like, what do these people, when you're hiring this person, and these are usually the first couple of hires of a company. So critically important. It's like, would this person do this thing that you're hiring them for if they weren't being paid for it? Like, what do they do on their weekends? Like, do they do these things for a hobby as well? Um, like that, it's not, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a, perfect test but it's pretty good you know if someone turns up and they're a software engineer and they say hey look here's my portfolio of stuff that i do on the weekend as well um that's sort of unrelated to this um you know you know they're going to do a good job like you know they're pretty pretty into this pretty obsessive you know it's the same with engineering as well like you know do they rig up um you know, like models of um you know, trains, if they're sort of rail engineers, do they build like their own, like a little electrical systems with breadboards and stuff like that as well. So like you want people who just love it. Um, and, and, you know, they probably don't even check their bank account at the end of the week to see whether they got paid. Like as long as money comes out, like they wouldn't care. And if they're getting paid to do this, they think, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. And yeah, they're special people to work with as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, I see a lot of myself in those people as well. Cool. I love that. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of like my first job when it was like, why do you want to work here at like Baker's Delight? And I just didn't understand the question. It's like, I need money. Like, what do you. I'm not bread. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, Ha, huh, so then what did you decide to do? Yeah, so um went went to university equally lost, I think. Um went down the BA BCom route, um, along with every other um student who uh you know knew that they should probably go to university but didn't know exactly what they wanted to do uh either. Um fumbled around in that terribly for a couple of years, I think, and then uh, yeah, it's pretty miserable, uh, I think, because I thought, eh. How come? Uh, I think because I had seen, um, I think I had thought that the world would sort of open up at the end of school. I had a great schooling experience for very good friends, but I thought, you know, university is the, you know, it's sort of the, the intellectual watering hole, like where you get to explore all these sort of interesting ideas and, you know, and dive into areas that um, that you're inherently interested in. And there's almost like a smorgasbord of things that you can pick and choose from. And it was a lot more, um, yeah, it was sort of like a lot more calculated than that. It was like, here's your course, you know, here's a couple of electives. Um, uh, Melbourne University was not the most like, um, I would say progressive in terms of their like course selection at the time as well. And yeah, it was, it felt like I was going through a sort of an academic exercise, um, uh, you know, to steal sort of a military analogy. It was sort of like, you know, 
preparing for preparing for war by going and playing zone three or like laser tag. Um, and it really felt like laser tag as opposed to the real world. Um, and I also thought like a lot of the subjects I was doing were, you know, very theoretical, not, I, not connecting with me. Um, so after a couple of years, I packed up and decided to travel the world. Um, you know, usual go and explore the world and figure out, try and figure out, um, try and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and yeah, as part of that, um, you know, spent 18 months, nearly two years, um, traveling and, you know, sort of a whole sort of different parts of the world, meet different people, um, all of that kind of stuff. Like certainly not oh my the first. God. Where did you go? Um, so did it, did it stint around sort of North America, but, you know, right through, you know, West coast, Midwest, um, into Canada, uh, spent a lot of time, you know, on Greyhound buses and just sort of finding a way around. Um, and then through Europe as well, um, over time just ended up on, you know, sort of bus, buses, backpacking around, um, yeah, nothing too, nothing too ad adventurous, really. Um, like a little bit of sketchiness in Eastern Europe, but um, nothing. Uh, yeah, it was a fairly sort of like, you know, it was very eye opening, and I think very f formative for me um, in just realizing that you know there are these things that you know, I, I if I want to go to. Budapest, I can go to Budapest tomorrow. Like I can jump on a bus and you've got this sort of like self-determination. Whereas I think what I'd left behind at university had been a very, um, you know, you're on, you're on tracks and here's a bunch, here's a couple of tracks. And, and at the end of that, you know, surprise, there's one of four careers at the end of it. Um, and you know, you can choose oh. any one of those four. Yes. Yeah. Maybe only three. Um, <laughs> but, um, and uh, it's like, oh, here's a, here's a couple of careers at the end of this that you can choose from. And where I was like, this is very, I think, affirming that I could go and actually do anything that I wanted to. Um... No, but that's great. Maybe that's from commerce because I'm thinking out of my maths degree, it's like there's no careers. <laughs> <That went wrong. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. So you know, like the BA part, that was like, you know, there are no jobs out of that. And then uh, BCom. It was like, well, you could be an accountant, you could go work in banking, you could go be a consultant, and maybe I made up a fourth. Um, you but know. that's <laughs> just Australia, because in the US or in the UK, it's like, oh, you're really smart and you studied medieval history, you can get whatever job you want. Yeah, I think I, I think it's a really interesting like observation of the Australian tertiary education system, and I, th I think a bit of that has changed, but... You know, I was fascinated to learn, you know, that, you know, a lot of the like Ivy League and top universities, they have a common first year. So everyone learns about, everyone learns a bit of maths, everyone learns a bit of medieval history, everyone does a bit of Egyptology. Um, and there is a sort of a general, um, you know, sort of bias towards like learning how to think, not what to think. Um, and yeah, I remember my dad telling me the guy who ran used to work for General Motors in the 80s when General Motors was the biggest company in the world. And the guy who ran General Motors had a degree in Egyptology. Um, and that was seen as a massive plus in, uh, you know, in the US. Um, whereas we kind of go, oh, what job do you get with Egyptology? Like, you know, we're not in Egypt. You know, it's sort of like, yeah, we are sort of, yeah, I think the sort of the education system is still probably is and definitely was then very linear. Um, um, and very much, you know, wrote, learned his what to think, not how to think, um, and explore the sort of world of critical thinking. Uh, I think it's changed a bit, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a very different, very different mindset, but I think something that is going, has had to shift and is going to have to shift. Um, particularly, you know, if I think about Australia as a country, um, and how, what, what are its future industries and what, what, does it, what does it do after it finishes digging things out of the ground? Um, 
yeah, there, there has to be some uh, people who think critically and think deeply about, you know, what what is the next industry that we're going to be great at. Um, and, yeah, I think outside of sort of mining and natural resources, um, yeah, there's sort of probably a big question mark there still. Huh. Okay, so did you, so were you working along the way? Like, because two years traveling, yeah, sure, people go traveling, but two years is a long time. Yeah, so like worked worked in ski resorts, picked up jobs along the way, lots of lots of cash jobs. Um, um, yeah, working in some hostels is the sort of like, you know, trade work on the front desk i funnily enough i was actually very like it was actually well suited to that because my one of my uni jobs had been working at uh working at the hyatt in melbourne and so like i had a bit of front desk experience um so like i could rock up to a hotel uh to a hostel and they say oh have you done this before i was like yeah and where did you do this previously i was like i had the grand hyatt in melbourne and it was this like dingy hostel you know off the beaten track in the middle of nowhere and i was like oh yeah i could I could do this for, you know, a week or two. And they're like, yeah, I think you think you're okay. I think you qualified, um, to man the, you know, to man the front desk of, uh, of the hostel. Um, uh, yeah, sold some, sold some shares that I had as well. I think liquidated everything I had to like, to make it last. Um, but yeah, just learn how to live like very frugally, I think was the main, uh, was the, was the main sort of takeaway from it. Like you actually, you know, don't need a lot of money to be able to live pretty well in lots of parts of the world. Um, and yeah, managed to, yeah, ma- managed to stretch a very small amount of money a long way, I think. And your attitude was like, okay, it's worth taking this time, investing in it, spending all my money because like answers will come out of this. Yeah, I think for me, that's probably a bit of revisionist history. Um, yeah, looking at that guy, oh, yeah, that's what was happening. I think it was just, I didn't want to do what I was doing for, and initially it started off for lack of a better idea, or this sounded like, I, I you know, I, I'd grown up most of my life in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, I think just, it, it was a bit um, cabin feverish almost, you know, sort of wanted to get out into, get out and see the rest of the world. And, um, and then I think the, uh, the deep philosophical part of it came later. I'm like, oh yeah, I learned all these great things along the way, and um, yeah, I, I I highly recommend it. Um, and we'd definitely, you know, d- definitely do that again and recommend that to people. In fact, I was talking to a to a guy today who is he he works in for one of the big consulting firms, um, and he has five kids, and he's been traveling the world working in working remotely consulting uh, consulting for like for the last nearly three years uh traveling the world with his family and uh I thought, wow what an amazing and you know we were speaking he's uh he's in he's in peru at the moment um you know moving somewhere else in a couple of weeks i thought wow it's pretty amazing like those experiences that he he's had and his kids will have uh would just be you know so much more valuable than you know sitting sitting in an extra you know ideology first year ideology lecture um or something along those lines um well at least that that was my sort of take on it huh and you weren't getting a hard time from anyone about it uh not not really but um there's probably an upper limit on pushing that like i think at some point uh, I, I, th- I think at some point, you know, I have to come back, um, into, into the orbit and, um, you know, go and do, probably go and do something at uni. Um, but no, it was never explicitly, um, <laughs> it was never explicitly said, but I think, you know, um, yeah, eventually like there was the unspoken part of, you know, you probably need to, at the very least, like go and get a degree or something like that. So, um, yeah, so that, that was, I, I, I held up my end of the bargain in the, in the end. Yeah. But, and you didn't feel shame about like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And my friends are all 
figuring stuff out? No, like I think it's one thing I've been, I, I, I've always um, been pretty good at is uh, good, good points. You know, just a trait is that I've always been pretty happy to take a slightly different path, even if that results in a lot of twists and turns along the way. Um, yeah, like the you know I friends who you know found their calling in life very early and it's, and they've known like what path they need to be on. And, um, I've never felt like that. Um, I'd never felt, uh, th there's a very clear direction for me. Um, and it's, you know, fantastic for them, um, that they were able to do that. But yeah, I was sort of thought in, you know, sort of inside, you know, thought I was always on a slightly different journey to a lot of people and that it was not going to be one that had a, yeah, that had a, that had a linear path to it. So then what did you do? Uh, I came back, um, and, uh, went, uh, I love skiing. Um, I spend all of my time at the snow, um, with my family if I could. Um, and so I, I wasn't quite ready to give up the like skiing half of the year lifestyle quite yet. So I actually moved up to Mount Buller, um, and managed, managed a ski lodge, um, for a couple of years, which was, uh, also a great job. Um, yeah, that's another one just sort of fell into it. Um, uh, I think was talking to the person who at Melbourne university who ran their ski lodge and, um, or who was in charge of it. And, they said, oh, you know, the person who was the manager's just quit. And I was like, well, I'm looking for a job and I like skiing. So, you know, I'll, I'll sign me up. And I think it was that simple. Um, and then, yeah, lived up there for, lived up there for three years. Um, and yeah, developed this love of the Victorian high country. Um, yeah, it's just this sort of magnificent place, unlike anywhere else in the world. Um, and yeah, sort of continued along this great life, uh, lifestyle, you know, met so many interesting people through that job, um, that, you know, still are really good friends with as well. And, uh, that lots of them have also had sort of weird and wonderful <clears throat> stories too. Um, yeah, but, uh, that was a very privileged couple of years to go and, you know, meet and meet lots of people, spend time, you know, doing what I love, which was skiing, uh, whilst I was also working as well. Like a lot of the work was on call. So, um, yeah, it was, um, just a magnificent couple of years. Wait, what did you do in the <laughs> other 10 months of the year that you can't ski there? In Bula? Like were you, what did you do in summer and spring? And yeah. Autumn? So so I take some time off from the mountain, but um, there's still jobs to do around the mountain um, during summer. It's a pretty amazing place during summer because the community shrinks from, lot, you know, a fairly decent size, you know, sort of small town equivalent population to almost no one. Um, and so, yeah, there's still like little jobs that need doing up there the whole year round. Um but very solitary. Um, like I enjoy, I enjoy my time by myself, but, um, yeah, at, at the end of the, at the end of year two, that was pretty extreme as well. Like you could go a day or two without really bumping into anyone else. Um, yeah, it was sort of like the COVID almost like the zombie apocalypse, um, had come and there was sort of like no one else on the roads, like, could drive wherever you wanted really and not see another car um yeah you wouldn't see too many people there are a handful of locals who lived up there year round as well um but yeah so <laughs> the short answer is like read a lot of books um you know do a lot of like do a lot of mountain biking you know do a lot of uh running that kind of stuff uh yeah which was yeah it was good fun Ah, huh, okay so it just appealed to you having that time yeah yeah i think the sort of like the whole um you know sort of character and culture of you know the victorian high country is like that and uh, yeah i've always felt an affinity with that the sort of like outdoor mountain 
type lifestyle uh, is pretty cool. Like if I didn't have, you know, sort of normal jobs and commitments and things like that um, in in Melbourne um, that, you know, sort of are more city-based, I would, you know, I'd move to somewhere like that in a heartbeat um, and be very, yeah, very happily live there, maybe six months of the year. Maybe that's something to, to aspire for when the kids grow up. Huh. Okay, so then at that point you were just like, I'm having some time exploring ideas and yeah, yeah, like so. Eventually, yeah, so I eventually came back, graduated. Um, this was GFC as well, and um, G- and uh, as and there were there were no jobs around. Um, there was also no startup activity. I'd contemplated, you know, do I go and sort of build a company? Um, having very little idea of what that entailed. Uh, so of all things that I said, I would not do, I went and went, it, uh, went to, went into banking. Um, and I, uh, have a number of things to be very thankful for. I worked for really good people in banking, learned some great skills, um, learned, um, you know, I think there's something to be said for being a spreadsheet jockey for a couple of years as well and learning how to master a spreadsheet in any job you come up against you know sort of later you know later in your career so did that work with some great people some who i still like you know do um some investing and some other um uh, some other work things with now uh which are fantastic um and then i also met my wife there as well so have that to be very thankful for uh but i think fundamentally like banking large companies were like i think it t- taught me that is not my natural home um politics i, I I didn't, um, I don't do well with politics. Um, I'm not naturally attuned, I think, to the, um, political sort of ebbs and flows of an organization. Uh, you know, someone said, oh, you know, such and such is, you know, they're sort of, pl- you know, conspiring to do this, this, and this. I was like, oh, really? I had no idea. Like, it was just totally oblivious to the, to, to the machinations of, you know, how, how big companies work. And, um, yeah, so I realized like that, that was probably, probably not for me. Um, and then, yeah, pretty, so I think that was there for three, three and a half years, um, in banking and then decided, Hey, I, I need, I need to get out. And the sort of realized that the startup world was calling for me. And this was sort of like more of my, like really natural calling was, you know, it was going to be startups. Why didn't you pursue the programming stuff? Well, that's, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I think 20, so this is 2008, 2009, there weren't a lot of, um, well-known software companies in Australia, I think to join none that had, um, none that had sort of known programs or had a, a strong sort of international reputation at that point. Um, Atlassian was probably the only one that was really peaking, you know, peaking out from the crowd. Um, and that was, you know, that was a one-off like there in Sydney. I, I didn't, I, I really wasn't sort of plugged in to that world. My um, use of software and programming. And I think the way that I, that it really spoke to me was this is a way to actually go and be autonomous and go and build a company like it's pretty something pretty special about programming and that you have an idea and then you can go and do something over a weekend or you know spend a week um, building it and you know you can have a company and people can pay you money for that and um that's you and you know you make a mistake you can go and you know you can go and rewrite that part of the software very quickly so yeah that was my you know that was my out um, that was my out of, uh, of corporate, of corporate Australia, uh, was, was programming. Huh. And so what did that look like? Yeah. So went and, um, founded and co-founded a couple of software companies. Um, so that was, and that's the sort of, um, yeah, almost the theme for, uh, you know, up until today almost. So, um, you know, build grow, go through the crazy roller coaster of, you know, building a startup company, um, and then either can, 
you know, continue to grow it or uh, exit it. And yeah, that has been, um, been the theme for me for the last 10 years. Like there's a lot that's packed into there. There's so many things that have happened since then, but I think, um, yeah, really like that's the, that's the, uh, sort of the ever present theme is, you know, go and find a problem, go and build some software around it. Um, or more and more these days, some sort of like AI model or machine learning model around it. Um, and then, yeah, go, go and go and see if you can get someone to pay, pay you for it. <laughs> and then if, you know, one person's willing to pay you for it, there's probably two, three, four, five out there that are willing to pay you for it. Um, and then rinse and repeat really ah okay because we're run out of time can we do a part two when you teach us about building companies and the wealth inequality stuff yes most definitely yes i would love to do that it's been (laughs) lots of fun so yeah we can definitely do a part two I'm like, we're not going to be able to jam. (laughs) It's going to be a very abridged version um, in a very short amount of time. Okay, but I'll just ask you one of the last three questions that I ask at the end. Oh, no, I can just ask all of them. I can just ask all of them. We have time. Okay. What book has had the biggest impact on you? Great Expectations. Charles Dickens. Dickens. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's such a, um, yeah, I think, I think it's got so many parallels to, um, so many parts of people's life and, you know, a lot of you know, my family's journey, like sort of feels like that a little bit as well, um, is that, you know, Pips, the sort of the, the poor kid from, um, who has some people who, you know, look out for him, um, and, uh, you know, that give it, give him a better life. And, uh, I think that sort of role of, uh, Magwitch in, um, great expectations of being the benefactor and, you know, wanting to help someone else out and give them a better life has been, you know, a, and try to, you know, make that, um, yeah, make that part of your sort of like core ethos, I think is very important, but also, you know, Pip becomes, um, you know, a bit entitled with what he's given as well. And I think, you know, there's some cautionary tales in there too, about, you know, entitlement, um, desire for things that are not actually important as well. Um, yeah. So, so I think, uh, great expectations, um, you know, all time, uh, greatest impact, uh, more recently, um, which, you know, is, is probably topical, um, with the conflict in the Middle East There's a great book called rise and kill first, which just taught me so much about, um, the Israeli state, um, and the history of it. And, you know, the sort of the, the many of the sort of, um, core beliefs and sort of founding ideals and, you know, how they have play, played out um, over the last, you know, 60, 70 years. Um, yeah, so that's been my probably top top pick of the last five years. But, yeah, those two together. Who wrote that? Uh, uh, right. Last name is Bergman and I think it's Ronan Bergman uh, wrote that. So he's a, he's a journalist. He's an Israeli journalist um, who is a – is a magnificent writer. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think really, really sort of, um, deeply impacted and connected me with that book. Cool. Um, okay. How do you stay grounded? Uh, I've got four kids, um, and they, like, they don't care like whether you've had the worst day ever or whether you've like flown to the moon or launched a, you know, a rocket to the moon, like, they just like come in, play with us, you know, here's this thing I made today. Ah, oh, I, you know, I've got this sport on the weekend, you know, their, their needs and their, um, and their wants like pretty, pretty simple and fundamental. And like, that's what they want to connect on. They don't care, uh, <laughs> what I've done at work or, um, some things like if it's sciencey stuff they do, but, um, yeah, they just, 
want to, they just want to play with you and just want to talk to you and, you know, you take an interest in the things that they're interested in as well. So yeah, it's pretty easy. Like their age is six through four, uh, six through four, that's nine, nine through four. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's pretty, it's, that's a pretty easy one. I find. Nice. And what three words describe the best version of Tom McLeod? Or, oh, uh, curious um energized um accepting cool okay thanks and we'll pick yeah, it up we'll, again <laughs> we'll pick this up for 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 chapter two amazing where can do you want people to find you in the meantime before before we record yeah, number two promote anything usually people like promoting that you know social, um, but, no you know. nothing really um i think some of the stuff we're doing here at melbourne uni about building uh research based startup companies um founded by fantastic research is pretty amazing um you know some really really cool companies um that you'll start i uh, hopefully will become household names um one that I'm an observer on the board of called Cell Bauhaus. Um, uh, check it out. Uh, they're doing some pretty amazing stuff um, in the synthetic biology space. Um, so yeah, just just have a look at some of the things we're doing um, on that front. A few of it's posted on my LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, uh, if anyone wants to learn more, they can definitely you know feel free to get in get in touch. Love chatting all things startup, technology, science, research building companies, um, always happy to chat to, to a new, to a new face as well. Amazing. Cool.